I often wondered if I were to start the astrophotography hobby from scratch, how would I do it? Hey everyone, it's John Reed here from Learn to Stargaze and author of the Things to See with a Telescope series, including the new book, 110 Things to See with a Telescope, a book that organizes the 200-year-old Messier list by season and provides a custom star map for every target. In this video, we're going to explore a simple astrophotography rig, one that I wish I'd known about when I was getting started in deep sky astrophotography. But just a caveat, I still consider myself a beginner astrophotographer. I use astrophotography mainly as a tool for outreach, sharing live images from an iPad during stargazing events. To see how the pros do it, definitely check out my favorite astrophotographers, Astro Backyard, Star Stuff with Dylan O'Donnell, Galactic Hunter, and Clive the Lazy Geek. This is Learn to Stargaze. First, some background. I started my journey into astrophotography with a cell phone and a small refractor. And the images, well, they weren't great. Here's me taking a video of the moon in 2009. Over the past 12 years, this video got 8 likes on YouTube, which is quite a compliment for me back in 2009. And this one time, my friend Sean and I got an okay video of Saturn by using a film grade camera attached to my Datsonian. I later upgraded to a DSLR and put this on the DAW, which I used to take some pretty good photos of the space station at the time. I actually posted a video on how to do this, which got me plenty of hate mail from the flat earthers. Flurfers? Anyway. Deep sky images with this rig though, not so much. I was mainly into visual astronomy anyway, and I put the prospect of astrophotography aside for several years. Fast forward to 2016, and I picked up my first equatorial mount, the Celestron AVX. I put together a basic setup the AVX mount, a 102mm refractor, sort of like this one, but with a shorter focal length. I used a DSLR and purchased the software Backyard EOS. But I was still dabbling here. This is not enough gear to actually get decent astro images. For example, here's M51, M31, and M16, taken in August of 2016, and M42, taken in January 2017. I didn't have a designated astronomy telescope either. I wasn't auto-guiding, I wasn't even doing accurate polar alignment, I wasn't taking calibration images, and I wasn't field flattening. I was simply taking 30 second to 1 minute exposures and saving them as JPEGs. But I feel like I did have some good excuses. I'd recently moved to Canada, I was a full-time astrophysics student, a full-time dad, renovating a 100-year-old house, and I was still primarily focused on visual astronomy for my books. I also worked at an observatory. If I wanted an astro image, I'd simply type the command into my phone, and the image would appear in my inbox the next morning. In fact, you can do this too. Check out the link in the description to get started. My next purchase was a real astrophotography telescope. Give me the, give me the cat. <laughs> give me the cat. Everyone that's making noise, put them on camera. My next purchase was a real astrophotography telescope. The Explore Scientific 102 triplet refractor, as well as a field flattener focal reducer. This was after watching several videos from one of the world's most famous YouTube astrophotographers. No, not you, Dylan. Yes, Trevor Jones of Astro Backyard. If you don't already follow Dylan O'Donnell, you'll probably need to clear your calendar. I had a lot of fun with this scope. I'd take it to work and let the students use it, and I got some okay images with this DSLR. But again, I wasn't fully committed. And the reason I still wasn't fully committed to astrophotography was because the only reason I wanted to do astrophotography in the first place was to share the night sky with people in real time. When you're at an outreach event trying to entertain a crowd of people, you don't have time for one hour exposures and image processing. It wasn't until the pandemic in 2020 that I decided to actually create a real astrophotography rig, one that could take long exposures. So I finally purchased a designated astronomy camera, a 294ZWO MC Pro, an auto guider, and an L Enhanced light pollution filter. I also bought this $20 light box for taking my flats. And then I purchased an ASI Air Pro for connecting the telescope to the computer. Oops, it's not true. To my iPhone. It's not accurate either. And then I purchased an ASI Air Pro so that I could control the camera and the mount from my iPhone. But the system wasn't perfect. The AVX mount is great, but it can be a little finicky with astrophotography. So I figured, well, I do do this for work. So I upgraded the mount to the EQ6R Pro. Now I had a lot of fun with the Pro mount. I tried it with my eight inch Newtonian. I tried it with an old C8 with marginal success, but really the 102 refractor was still the way to go. And I got shots like this and this and this. But as you probably realized, I spent a fair bit of money on gear and now I have this dining room full of astrophotography stuff. But of course, it's never enough. Hey hon, can I buy another telescope? 
So of all this stuff, how much do I still regularly use for astrophotography? Almost none of it. So here's the thing about starting in astrophotography. Many of the beautiful images, the ones that you want to use as a background on your computer, are simply too large to fit in the field of view of a normal telescope. M31 is too big, the Rosette Nebula, too big, M8, the Heart and Soul, all the North American Nebula, the entire Veil, these targets barely fit into the field of view of any of those telescopes, if at all. That's why many people recommend starting with a DSLR and a star tracker. In fact, Astro Backyard recently did a video very similar to this one where he describes his perfect beginner astrophotography setup, which is just that, a star tracker, a DSLR, and a very tiny telescope. And I do agree with him that that is a great way to get started taking amazing photos of space. But there's also something to be said for using a regular telescope, one that can also be used visually, and a designated astronomy camera, one that takes in a wider range of wavelengths, and a go-to mount that can also be used for regular visual observing. Well, in 2001, I discovered the Sharp Star 61, which is basically a cheaper version of the Radian Raptor. Or is the Raptor just a fancy sharp star with a better focuser and built-in field flattener? Anyway, it doesn't matter. If you want a more in-depth review of the sharp star or the Radian Raptor, check out a few videos by Clive the Lazy Geek. Now I started using the sharp star telescope on the large EQ6R Pro mount, but then I realized that this telescope fits onto my AZ GTI mount, a mount that I had originally purchased as a travel mount for this C90, but it took some modifications. I had to purchase this wedge, I had to purchase this counterweight bar and an extra counterweight, and I had to purchase an M8 to M12 adapter so that the counterweight bar would fit into the mount. Note that this telescope might also work with a Skywatcher star tracker. Let me know in the comments if anyone's tried this. Now this whole astrophotography system fits into this box and I take it everywhere with me. So if I were to start my journey into astrophotography all over again, I would start here. This is what it takes to get images like this and this and this. And being realistic about the cost, this setup here cuts just over 3,000 US dollars. Now let's go over the parts of this system. I'll list all prices in US dollars and note that this is 2021 and there may be some inflation by the time you're watching this. Now most of these parts can be purchased on OPT Telescope or B&H Photo or similar retailers. Also note that due to the holidays or the ongoing pandemic, many of these items may be out of stock. Let's start with the Sharp Star Telescope. Currently this costs about $699, but you also need the fuel flattener to go with it. That's about $199. If you want the Radian Raptor telescope instead with the field flattener built in, that costs about $999. The ZWO ASI 294MC Pro is $999. The Skywatcher AZ GTI mount is $400. This is the Skywatcher Star Adventure Equatorial Wedge Base, and that's $65. You'll also need an extra M8 bolt to attach the mount to the wedge. That'll cost you about $2. You'll need to purchase the counterweight bar with counterweight. I recommend a one kilogram counterweight and this one costs about $17.99. The M8 to M12 adapter you need to attach the bar to the mount. That'll run you about $10. You'll need a 50 to 60 millimeter guide scope of any brand. This is a Starfield and it costs about $200. You'll also need a guide camera. This is the ZWO ASI 120mm Mini. This costs $149. An ASI Air Plus costs $299. An L Enhanced Light Pollution Filter costs about $229. And you need something to power it. So you might get a Celestron power tank. This costs about $80. And if we add up everything I just mentioned, you're looking at over $3,000 US dollars plus tax. Now this may sound like a lot, but compared to some similar hobbies, it's really on par. Take DSLR photography, for example. A Sony Mark III camera plus an additional lens, well, that's $3,000. Or a premium Nikon camera, that could be well over $3,000 for just the body of the camera. Now, a few things of note about this setup. Using this mount in EQ mode, I believe is technically still in beta. You'll have to download a few pieces of software to make this work. Five the Lazy Geek has detailed and in-depth instructions on how to do just that. I'll post a link in the description to that video. Now for the most part, this setup has been flawless for me. The one challenge I keep running into is getting the ASI Air to connect wirelessly to the mount. So I'll cover that now. So you're in the ASI Air app and you want to connect the mount. You're going to hit mount settings. You're going to select EQ mod mount. You're going to switch from serial to ethernet. You're going to make sure the IP, at least this is what worked for me, is 10.0.0.2.6 at port 11880. And that's not TCP, that's UDP. And now you're gonna hit activate the mount. And now the mount's connected. 
Now before you do this, you might have to do something else. We're going to go into SynScan, which is the software for the mount. We're going to connect, select Equatorial Mode, okay. Now we're going to go into Settings, SynScan Wi-Fi. Now down to Modify Station, you're going to select that, go into Station Mode. The SSID should be the Wi-Fi network that is produced by the ASI Air. If you need to put in a password, put in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, done. Then hit apply, then hit connect. Okay, clear those menus, go back to the ASI Air, go back to the mount, try these settings again. And now you should be able to control your mount from your phone. All right, so really quickly, I'm going to go over the steps required to get photos of the sky using this setup. So I've already focused the telescope. I used the Bright Star Capella and the focus feature in the ASI Air app. Pretty straightforward. Now we're going to use the polar alignment feature. Now, the important thing to note here is that the telescope does not have to be pointed at the North Star or the North Celestial Pole. It just has to be within 30 degrees of it. And I've got a big tree there. So I position the telescope to avoid the tree. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna hit start, polar alignment in the ASI Air app. It's gonna take a photo. It's going to plate solve. That means it's gonna tell the telescope where it is. It successfully plate solved, so the telescope knows where it is. Then it's gonna rotate on the right ascension axis by 60 degrees. Once the telescope has rotated 60 degrees on its axis, it's gonna take another photo. If it's successful in identifying where it is in the sky, then it's going to give you instructions. So you're gonna say, let's go. Now it's telling me I'm seven degrees uh, off to left and right, and about one degree off up and down. So what I'm gonna do is adjust the telescope left and right first. So let's do that. Now I'm gonna hit the, the refresh button and it's gonna give me a new set of instructions. All right, now I'm only one degree off in each direction. Now we're gonna keep repeating these steps until our total error is under two arc minutes. So close. All right, now that our total error is within two arc minutes, we can hit finish and we are going to get the fireworks. So the next step is to take our flats and we need to figure out what exposure is going to give us a value of about 30,000 on the histogram. Okay. So we're gonna cover the lens with the flat panel and take a 0.2 second exposure and try that. All right, that was a little too high. Let's try 0.1. Perfect, right there. Now I'm gonna to go to live stack. And we need to choose, we need to go to flats. It's like 20 flats. And we're gonna choose 0.1. Done. Okay. All right, now let's take our flats. This is gonna take 20 exposures and stack them into a single master flat image. Okay, flats are done. Okay, with the flats done, it's time to go to our target. So tonight we're gonna to photograph the Lobster Claw Nebula, which is SH2-157. So let's see if we can find it in the database. Search. All right, found it. Now we're gonna slew over to the Lobster Claw Nebula. There it goes. So what I'm going to do is actually set up our live view shot here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to live. I'm actually going to use bin two here. Now I'm going to go into our into flats here and I'm going to select the flat 
that we just took. Select that. And I took some darks. Let me select these darks. Select. And I took some bias. And here are our bias files. Okay. So after each exposure, it is going to combine the light image with those calibration images. So now we just have to wait for 180 seconds for that first exposure to come down. Okay, one thing I forgot to do is turn on the auto guider. Before we take any more exposures, we're gonna open the auto guider menu. We're gonna hit this refresh button, which starts, starts the camera. And we're gonna hit this bullseye button, which starts the guiding process. Okay. All right, so here's our first exposure of the lobster claw. And it looks like it's centered. That's great. So one thing we can do is play with the histogram here to just see if we've got it framed the way we like it. And if it is uh, framed up just how we like it, we can then um, let, the, let the telescope roll and come back in a couple of hours and we will have our image. Okay, so the telescope has been taking exposures for just over an hour and it looks like we've got a really good image coming down. Now, so to save the image, what you do is just hit this button here on the bottom right hand side of the screen and it's gonna save a raw file of the image onto the pen drive there and it'll save a JPEG onto your device. All right, so I'm gonna let this run a little bit longer and then I will share the final image. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video on how I would start astrophotography if I were to do it all over again. If you have any of my books, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear from my readers. And please subscribe to Learn to Stargate so you don't miss the next video. And remember, the future is looking up. The dog desperately wants to get back here. <laughs> I had a lot of fun with the problem. <laughs>